You recall in the past hour, we're talking about why there's a dearth of women business leaders. But now we're talking about leadership on a different front. They've been at the forefront in the fight against COVID-19 pandemic. The two World Health Organization officials have also endured criticism from the leader of their home country. But they were not distracted. They are still leading a fight against the coronavirus. Our Foreign editor Sophie Mugwena spoke to Dr. Maria van Kirchhoff and Dr. Janet Diaz on a range of uh, issues in this exclusive interview. Kirchhoff and Diaz have uh, called on countries to be better prepared for the second wave of the pandemic. In Asia, Europe, North America, South America and Africa, the coronavirus pandemic has left a trail of destruction. Two officials of the World Health Organization had to steer the ship to the shore during the COVID-19 turbulence. Many of us are, you know, around the world who study these types of pathogens have been planning for, have been saying may happen, have been warning about. Um, and it was never a matter of if, it was always a matter of when. Um, and so there are many systems that are put in place to prepare countries, to ready countries for something like this. Um, however, no matter how much preparation you have, you know, when something like this happens, um, it's very difficult to manage uh, for, for many countries. And I think if you look at some of the countries and, and how, that they have, how they have responded, many of the countries that have done um, better than others, let's say, especially in the beginning, are countries that had, had experience with similar pathogens. I think one had to, at that point, become a little bit... Uh, practical in the sense and say, what can we actually do, even though we don't have a life-saving therapeutic? What can we do? We still can take care of patients. And that's where we started to, to, to emphasize to countries care pathways, the COVID care pathway. The COVID care pathway means that at the moment you suspect someone may have COVID, that you start isolation. So the first thing is to start, you know, prevent the disease from um, expanding or, uh, or affecting healthcare workers or nosocomial transmission or other patients. But the second thing there was identify if your patient is sick. Do they have severity, severe disease? Do they have complications? And if they do, then start to treat them. The outbreak, one of the biggest challenges for the World Health Organization in recent years. The Northern Hemisphere is currently facing a surge. Sub-Saharan Africa, is also seeing numbers going up. The World Health Organization says countries must prepare for the second wave and has warned against complacency, as some believe in immunity. We do not understand enough about the immune response to COVID-19. So there's, there's no uh, reason just because you've had it uh, once that you're not unnecessarily at risk or... Um, I don't know if yeah. you want to add on more. Yeah, it's also, it's also yes. So there's a lot that we're learning about uh, the immune response. And so when people are infected with this virus, they develop uh, an antibody response one, two, three weeks later. And people, even with asymptomatic infection all the way through severe disease, are developing an, um, an immune response. The issue is, is we don't have a complete picture yet of how strong that immune response is and for how long it lasts. And with more than 40 million cases reported mm -hmm. to date, we have some instances, about two dozen examples of reinfection. So that tells us, even though it seems to be rare, it can happen. And so everything that's been put in place needs to remain in place with all of these measures. But it's also a show of solidarity. So even if you have been infected, you know, making sure that you keep your distance, um, that you avoid these crowded settings, that you wash your hands, it's a show of solidarity. This is our new normal. Our new normal includes washing our hands regularly, carrying an alcohol-based rub, um, keeping physically distant from others while socially connected, avoiding in crowded places, um, you know, making smart decisions. All of us need to continue to be our own risk manager mm -hmm. and make these decisions um, that are right for us. If it doesn't feel safe, don't do it. Um, so all of us are in this together. For now, all residents and citizens in South Africa and across the globe are required to adhere to the basic COVID-19 protocols as we continue to fight the biggest virus since the Spanish flu. Sophie Mkwen, SABC News, Johannesburg.
And as you can see, there is no dearth of leadership in the public health space of women. We speak to another uh, such at the helm of the World Health Body. We're joined now by Dr. Matsiri Somwedi, who is the regional director of WHO Africa. A very good evening to you, Dr. Mwedi. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Let's look at sub-Saharan Africa. Is it doing better in terms of COVID-19 in comparison to other regions of the world? You've just heard uh, my colleague, uh, Sophie Mugwena, they're speaking about a rise now in figures. Yes, uh, thank you very much for having invited me, Tepiso, and good evening to your viewers. Indeed, in comparison to most other regions, Africa appears to be doing relatively well with regard to the COVID-19 pandemic. So our region, meaning Sub-Saharan Africa plus the Algeria, and in fact, even if we add in the rest of the North African countries, the region has about 14% of the world's population, but accounts for only 3.1% of cumulative COVID-19 cases at a global level and 2.6% of deaths. So only the Western Pacific region has fewer cases. In addition to that, We've experienced a downward trend. In July, there were about 15,000 cases, new cases per day. Now, for the, last past, for the past month, we've seen about 4,000 cases per day. But we have to say that in the last couple of weeks, this decline has slowed down, has stalled, and we're observing more of a plateau. In fact, we see that um, we have about 14 countries where there is a slight increase, so 20% increase compared to the last four weeks in the daily cases. But we still have 23 others where the downward trend is continuing. So I, I think the most important thing to note is that the situation is stalling. We'd like it to continue to go down, and the work needs to continue to help it to go down. If we look at deaths, we've had a case fatality, so the number of, of uh, deaths by case of 2.3%. That's among the lowest in the world. So 28 com compared to the whole population per million, compared to 620 or so in the Americas, almost 300 in Europe. So Africa has indeed seemed to do relatively well. It's not the scenario we're expecting, but we are at a point now when countries are opening up the economies. So those public health uh, interventions, the personal actions that we all have to take are absolutely important. Mm. Dr. Wetu, the issue of the reliability of data when it comes to the continent has been raised a number of times, what with uh, a lagging when reporting national figures, but also uh, testing, inability to test, lack of testing, not enough testing. What's your view on that? Yeah. Uh, there's no doubt that we've had a significant uh, challenge, I think worse than many other regions, but similarly to some, in having sufficient testing supplies, especially the global market just became too distorted, it became difficult to get these supplies. So there is undoubtedly some underestimation of the actual numbers. But in fact, several features make us think that we don't have a devastating, undetected pandemic going on in Africa with thousands of people dying. So, for example, as, as countries have been able to expand their testing, we have seen a range of positivity rates. So in some of the countries, countries like Senegal, like Ghana, they did expand the testing. And they found that you didn't get a commensurate increase in those the proportion that was positive. So we think as well that uh, some of the surveys that have been carried out in some of the countries, including in groups like healthcare workers, have shown that there is indeed some underestimation, but not a, a huge degree mm. of, of underestimation. And then as for deaths, you know, the pandemic in Africa is mainly in urban areas. And we know, even if our death reporting is not perfect, that death is a very public event in our culture. Family members will come, people will come. So we do not think that there is such a huge underestimation of the situation. Undoubtedly, there is some degree of underestimation. Mm. Dr. Moti, there is new testing being done now. If you could just tell us about it, the benefits of the new antigen rapid test compared to what most countries have been using. Yes. So up to now, the recommended test by the WHO and what most countries have been able to get access to and use is a polymerase chain reaction test or PCR test. That's what most African countries have been using. The main plus of this test, of course, is that it's the most accurate. But we're very, very encouraged by now 
WHO having given an emergency use licensing of a couple of rapid tests because these tests are, first of all, simpler to use, so you don't need laboratory capacity of the type you need for a PCR. You can do it out in the field. It is much easier to do so that you don't need the highly qualified laboratory technicians. People, of course, have to be properly trained to use this test. And very importantly, these tests are quick in terms of getting your results. So within 15 to 30 minutes, you can get a test result compared to averages we've seen of uh, two days, sometimes as long as a week to 10 days in, in many countries in the region. Because this then means you can know quickly if somebody is infected and therefore you can start the public health interventions of looking for their contacts, isolating them and isolating the, the contacts. So the, the fact that these tests can get out into the districts, into the countryside where the systems are weaker means that they can be there as we are seeing the threat now of upticks and the new surge as the countries are opening up their economies. So this is a very huge advantage, a game changer, we think, in terms of capacity to deal with the pandemic mm. in the region. But I'm sure that game changer comes with guidelines. So what is the WHO's advice of when they should and shouldn't be done these antigen tests? Yes, indeed. So these are antigen tests. And, uh, you know, one the big problems with the many uh, rapid tests that have been produced in the last few months has been their performance in terms of accuracy. So in terms of sensitivity, meaning not missing uh, a positive case, and specificity, meaning not falsely finding a positive in a negative case. So their best performance is among people who have a high viral load. So generally, that's in people in the early stages of infection, either pre um, symptom or in the early symptom. So they can be used very much where we suspect that there is spread going on, there is a case and we want to see if there could be contacts that are positive among this case where we suspect clusters or where there is community spread. And then also in places where there might be uh, cases in close contact settings like prisons, among high-risk groups like healthcare workers and where we know that there is uh, widespread community transmission. We just need to find the cases and take the action to isolate them and their contacts. Where we advise they not be used, for example, is where the likelihood of illness is low. So in screening healthy travelers, in screening school children, blood donors, etc. So they cannot be used or we are not recommending their use in point of entry uh, screening, for example. But certainly where we suspect that there is something going on and also they can be used in carrying out surveys to see where the virus might be circulating. They are going to make a big difference. Mm. My final question is about the situation in Nigeria. Obviously, we've seen large gathering of protests and uh, there has been concern raised about whether or not there uh, is a possibility or potential of super spreading events. Uh, are you as a WHO concerned about this? Yes. I mean, first of all, I'd like to express my sympathies to, to the families who've lost loved ones during these protests uh, which, which are taking place in Nigeria. And also in the situation in Guinea, Guinea Conakry, where we've seen protests about the results of the, of the election. Large gatherings of people do have the potential to become super spreader events, especially under these circumstances. People are not taking precautions, emotions are high, people are shouting etc., and the precautions are simply not there. So we are very concerned about such situations. And just linked to that, secondly, we know that there are upcoming elections in at least eight countries in the African region before the end of this year, and we are advising the governments that all precautions have to be taken, you know, in campaign events and, and including in the actual elections themselves. And we have seen some occasions where there has been large numbers of people gathering, and the right precautions have prevented an uptick in cases. For example, in Senegal recently, tens of thousands of uh, Muslims made an annual pilgrimage with many, but uh, they were practicing the preventive measures, the distancing, the hygiene, the masks. Uh, so it was a well-planned process. And we think if that happens, these events uh, can, can be prevented from being super spread events. But of course, under such circumstances as, uh, you know, people demonstrating rioting, unfortunately, the risk then is there and we should be ready immediately afterwards to spring into action with even more concentration to contain mm. any of
Dr. Mweti, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. Uh, Dr. Matsidi Mweti, the WHO Regional Director for Africa, bring us up to speed on the figures on the continent and what's been done to continue to flatten the curve, including the introduction of new antigen tests. Still to come, though, on the full view, we'll speak to the organizers.